Hello. Um, Wendy's going to do a wee check for us, just to make sure if you want to pop in and see if we can find a live stream. But hopefully we're live, Cara, and if anybody's out there watching us, thanks for ver thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we're just coming uh, on tonight to sort of help promote Dr. Cara Kennedy's new book, uh, which is entitled Women's Agency in the June Universe. And there we go. We're just This is a first time for us folks, so if you're popping into the station tonight, I'm not too sure if any of you are there. Uh, but I know a few, a fair few of you check the live streams afterwards, and we're good. Yeah, everything's looking great. We're all good, car. So that's great to know. And there's Babs Bilo. And hello, Babs. How are you? Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, saying hello, Doc and Cara. So we're good, Cara. Everything's going according to plan. We're a little bit early tonight, um, so I'll just run through a few wee things for you tonight. We're just going to introduce Cara, and we'll have a wee bit of a chat about June itself and the June series. And then we're going to have a wee run through some pre-prepared questions for Cara about her book. And then we're going to open this all up to a Q&A for a bit of fun. So um, I think this is going to be quite enjoyable. I'm really looking forward to it. And if you do have any questions, type away in the, uh, the chat room. I'm just going to set that to live chat so that we can see everybody talking. There we go. Bob's saying, looks like it's just a little me of right now. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much for joining us, Babs. By the way, Cara, Babs is a, a, a big, big June fan and often asks me quite difficult questions about Alia, for example. Um, so I think she's going to be particularly interested in this. Um, and we do have a bunch of regulars that hopefully they'll join us in and uh, as we go. So um, we'll just we'll just do a wee bit of. Are we able Are we able to put a link to my website on the YouTube description? Yes, we will. Um, anything like that, uh, what I'll be doing is once the live stream's done, we can go in and set that up for people to see it again. So we'll be able to put a wee link to purchasing the book and there's a coupon code, isn't that right? And uh, or Can I put it in the chat? Yeah. Oh, you can type it into the chat, yeah, if you're in the same room. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, this is all. This is like a TV studio software thing, so I, I haven't figured out how to get my chat over here. But yeah, it's all new, but as I said, doing this... Uh, with yourself it's kind of kicked me up the back side a bit to go and muck around and unfortunately I am a computer guy so I can go oh, too much at it so I thought what we'd do tonight is just set up a, something nice and simple and uh, we have a uh, it's quite funny watching it on the other monitor because there's a slight time delay uh, to do with latency and so on so it, it's interesting I think it's very interesting and uh, so this is the first time we've done this so uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us Cara and thank you very much for being my first ever guest on the studio, uh, or on the, on, the, on the studio, on the science fiction station. And um, oh, thanks for having me. Oh, it's it's great. I'm really delighted. I have to say, um, we've just been having a wee chat before we came on here, just about I suppose um, our reason d'être is for doing PhDs in June, and uh, I think we have a lot in common. And um, uh, we've we've been. I'm going to close the window here, folks. Hang on, we've got doggies on the prowl. Oh, as you, sorry, Cara. As, oh, we've lost Cara a wee bit there. But um, as you know, folks, uh, <laughs> generally that we're, we're broadcasting our space station is also known as the dog house uh, because of uh, this is our dog house. And so I hopefully we'll not have too many interruptions from Evil Noodles and um, Holly Holiday. Uh, but they, they did make an appearance on our last <laughs> our last program when we introduced them. So uh, we've been having a good wee chat about just, um, well, I suppose we, we've, we've met a wee bit and, and had a lot in common with this, doing a PhD in June. And uh, uh, I'm just going to read a wee quick comment here from Babs. It's, I'm going to have to bring this a bit closer, aren't we? Figuring out how to do these things. Uh, it says, most definitely looking forward to this. Doc knows, my, Doc knows how much I like uh, academia, bringing your work to we non-university folks. And well, Babs, thank you very much for that comment. And I suppose this this is the thing that actually myself and I hope she, Cara doesn't mind me saying this. I think the thing that we both have in common is um, a real strong desire to bring um, science fiction academia to the general public. And um, as much as I've done myself, my wee station, Cara's got uh, JuneScholar.com, and. Uh, Pretty much has just produced this book. As I said, we're going to have a wee chat about it tonight. But both of us are very much on the same page. And it's all about uh, making this stuff accessible to people, I think. Um, especially, we were just having a wee chat about how inaccessible some of this stuff is. You know, so... Um, to, to me, to me, it's science fiction as a genre. It's 
one of the most popular genres. So to have it be locked away in the academy is so ironic. <laughs> it is. It, it strikes me as bizarre, and, and I often thought about it that it's, it's popularity, maybe, that is what kind of kept it in that position, I think. Um, we were having a wee chat last night about... It was actually to do with... Uh, New, the New Scientist magazine that looked at June and all, um, it was a New Scientist magazine, I think, going back a good few years, and it was, it was asking the question, is science fiction in decline? Um, it, was, it was also the, the, the issue that polled a lot of scientists as to what is your favourite science fiction book, and of course, we all know which, which, which book they, they answered. It was a, a very much a strong win for June. And, and we're actually getting, it's, it's a very interesting episode, I was talking about it a wee bit the other day, or should I probably call it an issue of New Scientist, um, but it, particularly because it was focused all on, on um, science fiction and had a good wee chat about uh, June itself, and particularly its popularity and why it's popular amongst scientists. Um, so I, th I thought it was really interesting, you know, but it, it's it, there is a sense that science fiction academia is outside the rest of the academic world. I think you know, and um, I'm sure I think you it's agree. Still on the fringe, I think. Still on the it's fringe, and just a, moving its way, trying to gain some territory. But uh, oh, and there's a new book that just came out called Shakespeare and Science Fiction. Ah, uh -huh. that oh. looks really interesting. I've seen a, <laughs> I've seen a, a, a few. Uh, what is it they do? Um, Star Wars has been done as Shakespeare now. That there's this kind of. Oh, those are so fun! Those are so fun. Oh, I haven't read any of them, but I, I have a big problem with Shakespeare, and I, as you, I'm sure you all know what it is. Shakespeare rips off the <laughs> classical world. I think you know, and uh, I always tell. Borrows people, from Russ. Borrows from. Borrows from. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, actually, massively rips off on a, on a couple of cases, I have to say. He's just literally stolen. But I suppose it was the Renaissance, and that was the point of the Renaissance. All this stuff had come back, you know. But, um, yeah, I'll tell you what, Cara, shall we, shall we get things rolling then? Sure. I think because we've hit nine o'clock. Oh, and I'll tell you what, we've a wee bunch of comments here. I'll just read them out before we we'll get our introductions going. Um, we've got Carl Blessing saying, Hello, Cara, so excited about your book. And Bab saying, Howdy Carl, glad you could join us. Uh, we have a uh, Leah McReynolds saying, Hi Carl, so excited for this and for you. And uh, hey, Leah, thanks for coming back. And okay, you have somebody saying something died, but I think we're all good, we're still online. So I'll, I'll let us a few wee introductory comments, which is nice to hear from people. So we've got a bit of an audience, and I said, We'll put this up. And oh, here, here she comes, it's Holly, Holly, Holly Holiday. Hello, big love. <laughs> Come on, you. Uh, give me one wee second, folks. This, this is a thing that happens at the doghouse. You ready? Go on. Go on. Go get him. Go get him. I'll tell you, give me one wee second, folks, just to get this doggy out of here. Come on. Wendy. Sorry, I'm getting invaded. Come on. Out you go. Come on, please. Come on. No, come on now. Out. Seriously, go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. That's a good girl. Good girl. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Right, I'm so sorry about that, folks. It is, it's one of the joys of broad, broadcasting from home. As I said, uh, uh, for anybody who doesn't get the reference, our science fiction station is called The Dog House uh, because of, uh, it's the name of the space station in Strontium Dog from 2080 where all the mutants hang around. So it's called The Dog House and it, and it literally is a dog house. So I do apologise about that. And uh, I'm just going to start off tonight. We're joined with, joined with, uh, by Cara Kennedy tonight, Dr. Cara Kennedy. And we're going to have a wee chat about her new book, Women's Agency, in the June series. So just to start off, um, I'm just going to give you a wee bit of an introduction to Cara. And we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about June, just for those who are not too familiar with the series. And then we're going to get some questions to Cara, and I'm going to shut up and let her do all the talking, because you know what I'm like, I'll just keep going. So uh, we'll get Cara on to you in a wee second. Let's have a wee just, I'll just run through some of this. Um, as it just hi, I know Cara. By the way, is in terms of, I suppose, reaching out to um, anybody <laughs> who's interested in June with my academic work, and we've we've talked a wee bit about this. But the, of all the people that we've reached out to, Cara's actually the only person <laughs> who replied to me, and we've had a wee bit of a dialogue going back and forth uh, over the last year or so, and it's been great to sort of actually meet and chat to someone who's as invested in these books as I am. And uh, uh, the, other, the other sort of thing I'll just mention before I tell you a wee bit about Karen is that often within my own work, um, we've talked about this, about how I suppose the process of a PhD where at the end of the day, stuff has to go. 
and m my work got obliterated in terms of things like the Bene Gesserit and uh, the feminist aspects of the work and work on sex and gender. So the one thing that I had said to Cara was that because of that, my work comes across as very what I would call male centric, which I was quite appalled by. And um, I did my, my PhD on the Dune series about 11 years ago. So what I was absolutely delighted to see um, uh, was this representation of women in the Dune universe and that work was being done on these aspects of feminism, sex and gender, etc. And mainly because I was quite appalled that I had to leave them all out. Um, and so it, 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 I've actually said that I think that the, our two, H, two PhDs actually together really pr provide a good balance to the Dune universe in terms of academia. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted, by the way, Cara, and just say thank you very much for asking me to do this. It's a real pleasure. So I'm just going to tell you a wee bit about... Oh, oh thank you. It's, it's genuine, you know. I'm just going to tell you a wee bit about Cara, uh, and uh, we'll just run through a wee bit of information about her and have a wee ch quick chat about June. And as I said, then I'll stop all the gab and we'll get some questions to Cara and let her do the chatting. So just in terms of what Cara's been up to, Cara's been studying June for quite some time, as have I. And uh, Cara did her honours project during her undergraduate degree in California and looked at the representation of the character Jessica as a strong woman uh, who went beyond stereotypes despite being in a male-dominated culture. Um, Cara's carried on that work then, went to the UK to do her master's degree and expanded this analysis to include the Bene Gesserit as an organisation as well as other female characters. Um, ultimately, as you know, the career path leads to a terminus degree. She's ended up in New Zealand uh, and has completed her PhD on the Bene Gesserit across the full six books of the Dune series. Uh, for those of you who are aware, a lot of academia does not cover the six books. Um, it's probably just due to the sheer scale. So she's also got an interest in looking at world building, mythopoeia, and has published articles on the role of names, the social sciences, and the influence of Lawrence of Arabia as well as the spice and ecology in June. She believes, as we were talking about, in making science fiction scholarship more accessible to the general public, uh, which is why she started her blog, junescholar.com, and writes for popular media such as science fiction and fantasy site, tour.com. So that's a wee bit of blurb about uh, Cara. And this is the fun bit, I suppose. I was asked to do a brief summary of June. <laughs> Whoa, is there such a thing? I don't know. Um, I'll go with a wee bit of info here for you. It's just this is for anybody's benefit who doesn't know the Dune series. And of course, we, we have the arrival of Dune Part 1 in the cinema at the minute, uh, directed by Denis Villeneuve, which seems to be doing financially quite well. So, Dune was first serialised in multiple instalments in the science fiction magazine Analog from 1963 to 1965 as Dune World and the Prophet of Dune. I've got my copies over there. And um, is later published in novel, as a novel in 1965. So June won both the top awards in the science fiction at the time, which is the Hugo and Nebula Awards. And of course there are five sequels, um, the June series spanning, I'd argue, probably three or four decades. Uh, the first being 65, the last being published in 85. But uh, if you think that Herbert started really working on this in the 50s. Um, the first film adaption came out in 1984 by director David Lynch, it's somewhat controversial, I think. Uh, well, not necessarily controversial, but I think you either love it or you hate it, and I happen to love it. Um, um, and I think we'll maybe have a chat about our, our opinions on the new Dune movie later on. And of course we've seen a TV adap adaption uh, with the, the miniseries and followed on by Children of Dune. And then, um, we've, as I said, we've got the new Denny Villeneuve version. So, um, it's hard to summarise what Dune's all about. It is um, a bizarre... Uh, see, I suppose um, it's it's a very, very dense book and it's it's just full of, oh, I don't know how to put it, it's complex, I think that's the word we all like to use, and it is of considerable length, I think it comes in just over a million uh, words, and uh, even has a plot that goes across several thousand years. Um, but here's, a, I'll say, we'll go with a brief description. The Dune series is set in a universe with a medieval-like feudal structure, that has developed in response to the Butlerian Jihad, which is a human revolt in the distant past against thinking machines that saw them banned and forces the creation of um, human schools of education, if you like, that uh, make, uh, I suppose, kick away the technical crutch and make humans develop their own abilities. Um, the first June book features the story of the family of House Atreides, 
Um, Duke Leto, Lady Jessica, who's a member of the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, a semi-religious order of women who are involved in politics of the Imperium, and of course their son, Paul. As they move to the planet Dune, the only location of a giant sandworm that happens to be, that happens to produce the most prized thing in the universe, which is the spice, a drug known as melange. Um, and this is, of course, where their enemies, the Harkonnen and the Amber, have laid a trap for them. So it's all quite Machiavellian. Obviously, things don't go well for the family, and we see a kind of um, traditional heroic route. Uh, Jessica and Paul are forced to escape into the desert, where um, Jessica uses her Bene Gesserit skills to find safe passage among the locals known as the Fremen, whose tribal culture has been prepared by various, uh, sorry, by previous Bene Gesserit women of the mission area Protectiva to accept a Bene Gesserit woman and her child as fulfillments of a prophecy. Um, while it's pregnant with her second child, Alia, Jessica undergoes the Water of Life ceremony, becomes a religious leader, excuse me, sorry, Oh, no, oh, oh dear, dear, I forgot I had a phone in the room. I do apologise, Cam. Cam. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, folks, that things happen. Um, where were we? Uh, do, 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 culture being prepared. Yeah, sorry, apologies about that. Jessica undergoes the water life ceremony and becomes a religious leader known as the Reverend Mother, known as the Reverend Mother, which changes both her and Ali's psyches. Uh, because he's part of the Bene Gesserit secret breeding program and his mother trained him in the Bene Gesserit way, Paul is also able to ingest the water of life and alter his psyche, uh, although he gains access to his visions of the future as well. He was supposed to be under the Bene Gesserit's control, but due to circumstances, he is not. And he is continually taught and guided by his mother throughout the entire book, even up until the final scene, so she remains a strong presence in his development. The later June books explain Explore the consequences of Paul's leadership and his religious war, and the final two books are mainly focused on the Bene Gesserit as the main characters who are fighting a rival all-female group known as the Honored Matres, who are more like the evil Harkonnen in their operations. So it's it's a huge book in scale and scope, and um, I often argue very Machiavellian, very political in its machinations. And it's quite tricky to explain to people what Dune is all about. Um, just fundamentally, it's, it, it, has, it contains a number of warnings about uh, dangerous heroes. Um, the uh, ecology also being one of the major, major uh, themes of Dune. And um, as I said, the Dune books take a very interesting shift in the last, uh, the last two books. And it, it's often noted that a lot of people drop away from the books at this point, which I think is rather sad. Um, I have to say that in my, own in my own mind are the ones that I can remember the least at the minute just because I've been working on so much other stuff. So I'm quite fuzzy about these things. Um, I have to tell you, by the way, Cara Babs is not. Babs is well sharp on all of this stuff, has been keeping me right as I, I keep going, what is it in Chapter House June? I cannot remember. Um, so sorry about that. A couple of, uh, it's all amateur here, isn't it? Anyway, a couple of uh, phone calls and things like that, making noises in the background, but it all is good. So, um, I've, as you can probably figure out, I could keep talking like this for quite some time. So I'm going to put the first of, the question, of these questions to Cara and let her chat away. And um, I suppose the first thing, you've heard me sort of give a bit of a blurb, you know, a uh, formal sort of introduction to yourself. Why don't you tell us a wee bit about yourself, actually, Cara, rather than me sort of going through it. I think it would come across a bit better, first of all. About me. So I've been an English major my whole life, and I only got into Dune at the end of my undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. So I think most people don't get to study science fiction in a traditional classroom, and that was also the case with me. Um, but I really wanted to study my favorite novel, which can be really dangerous because sometimes when you study something, you you get too critical of it. And I was definitely worried about that, but I thought, oh, I think I think this book can, can handle, um, you know, scholarly study rather than just enjoying it as a, as a regular reader. And so I first read Dune when I was a teenager, like many people, and I'm not really sure how much I understood of it at the time. I know I really enjoyed it, and that's around the same time that I got into other science fiction and fantasy, mm -hmm. the kind of transformational period in life. 
and I found the Dune series really interesting and engaging, and so I just ate up the sequels um, all the way up through Chapter House, and I was really sad that it came to an end and Herbert didn't get to finish the final the final book, but um, <laughs> it was nice that there were six books to get to to be in that universe. Mm. It's, it's so sad that he didn't get. I think the one the one thing that we get all of that I'm not finishing Dune series is we've got endless things to talk about because of that. I think it's it is genuinely all the speculation that we can come to what might have happened. You know, um, yeah, it's interesting. I suppose in terms of science fiction, it's it, you hardly ever encounter it in the classroom. The only the only science fiction book I ever encountered in any form of education outside of university it was 1984. Um, and that was, oh I'll tell a lie the time machine actually as well um, but that's it um, just there's, it's, there's those, are, those are more considered like literature I you know, know. Like, those are kind of like accepted as you know more classics um, that so yeah that's that, that's a whole debate but um, oh I don't, yeah, I there's certain there's certain ones that are allowed to be you know considered literature I think for for people and then there's ones that are more science fictiony. Um, that don't I, get to be, don't don't get to be in the canon. Yeah, I, I, I still think the one book that everybody tells me is not a science fiction book. I've, I've put this up there. The one book that I keep getting told, nineteen eighty four, and I just I don't how can it not be? <laughs> it's just just bizarre. I think it's funny, but uh, yeah, it, I suppose it, it is interesting what you're saying about it. science fiction is just not, it's just not really there, is it? And certainly not in this country. It's completely absent, you know. Um. Could you tell us tell us a wee bit more about the book? Actually, Cara, uh, your book's called um, Women's Agency in the Dune Universe. I've got the full title here somewhere, if I could <laughs> bear with me a wee second, just to do you proper justice. Tracing Women's Liberation Through Science Fiction. There we go. Um, could you tell us a wee bit more about what, what's the main argument and one of the main threads of the book? Sure. So... When I started, when I first studied Dune, I just had time or just had enough space in the Honors Project to look at Jessica. So I always wanted to look more. So for Masters, as you said, I, I was able to expand and look at other characters and look at the Benny Gesserit, but I still didn't have that depth and that scope to be able to look really deeply. And I also wanted to look at all six books. So for me, the PhD was really an opportunity to give it justice and look across the series and try to trace threads that that start in the first book and then are expanded on or further developed. Mm. So, and then for, for a PhD, you have to add more theory and you have to add more kind of contextualization than you do, um, say, in, in, at the lower degree levels. And so I decided, um, well, first of all, I decided to take what, uh, scholar William Tuponce had written in his 1988 book on Frank Herbert, mm. and he said, whether or not the Dune series is ultimately feminist and the images and voices of women it projects is an open question. And here it was, no one had ever taken, taken up that question to really look at that since mm. the 80s. And so I decided to take that as my kind of focus point is answering that question. So my argument is really looking at an analysis of the female characters of the Bene Gesserit and looking at how do they align with what was going on in history during the time these books were written, which was a time of great social and cultural change in the U.S. and elsewhere. And I also looked at, are these characters stereotypes or are they more three-dimensional? Do they have complexity? And then also tracing what was going on with uh, women at the time, what was going on with the second wave feminist, feminist movement and those kinds of theories so it was a lot, but I tried to try to trace these threads in the book and also what was going on in history at the time. Um, and, and it was hard because you have to separate things into chapters when you write a thesis or you write a book. And so Dune is so interwoven with, with itself as so many layers. So I chose five main areas that I thought I could pull apart into separate chapters. And so these are the main structure. Uh -huh. um, so the, fir the first is what I call the mind-body synthesis, which is a kind of clunky term, but I was just trying to explain this is how women are able to use both the mind and the body 
and kind of a balance or in harmony with each other to uh-huh. their advantage, rather than just being all about the mind or just being all about the body. They really use both together. This is the problem. And then the second, the second focus area was reproduction and motherhood, which are huge topics um, in women's studies. How women have control over reproduction, what's their role in mothering, how do they guide their offspring, which is a big thing in Dune. And the third thing I looked at was voices. And so oh. this includes physical voice, which uh, Benny Jesuit used, and vocal control. It also includes reading someone else's voice to see if they're telling the truth or not. Mm-hmm. And then it's also looking at what, what's the number of women's voices in the books. And so this is looking at where do they appear in the main text, where do they appear in the epigraphs that start each chapter. Mm. And the fourth thing I looked at was education and memory. And this includes how the Bene Gesserit have a school or have schools and teach young women and girls. And then also how they gain access to a women's ancestor, ancestral memory. And then the final thing I looked at was sexuality. And so this is looking at women's sexual activity, what kind of control, what kind of self-determination they have. So those are the five the five pieces that I put together as, as chapters to try to look across the Bene Gesserit and across what they do. Um, so that, it, it was a difficult challenge to figure out how to structure it, but that's what I ended up with. And, and so I used those five things to look at what was going on in history, what was going on in feminism, and what's going on in these books. Mm. I, I totally get what you're saying, but I mean, for anybody who knew, who's looked at my own work, the, the whole, what you said is that, that Frank Herbert has these themes that are so tightly woven together that and he's actually said this, that if you deliberately try to unwind one, he's decided to make it that hard for you. It's, it's a very, I don't know where it is, almost helical set of themes, hard to separate within the Dune series. And um, as I said, where, where you got to, I, I would argue that the, particularly with uh, the bulk of the stuff that's in your work, is in the, in the two books at the end, book five and book six of the Dune series. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, aye, it's, it's sometimes described as... I don't know, some people are a bit funny with these two books, and I've heard funny descriptions of them in terms of how uh, sex, for example, uh, people have talked about that the, the, the Bene Gesserit books are a bit weird in the sex, uh, and uh, things like um, the sexual imprinting of Duncan Idaho and etc etc and of course Frank Herbert's famously bad um, sex scene in the book which involves I think sausages if I have to say it it's quite it's one of the worst written sex scenes ever but it's uh, it is all of this um, yeah it's fascinating I have to say and, and the Bene Gesserit are for those who are not too aware a fantastic creation I think I've got a good question for you later, actually, but I'll keep it till we get to the Q and A. Uh, I just I wanted to ask you something about the Bene Gesserit. That I think you can answer, but um, yeah, the Bene Gesserit books are are a bit interesting, and, and they're very much. I suppose are they both in the eighties? Um, we have that that development. Frank's Frank's work changes, and I think he's changes a good bit as he goes along. In terms of women's agency, just for our audience tonight, could you tell us a little bit about what you mean by that term and how you use it in the book, Cara? Yeah, so I chose to use the term and the, the, the theory of agency rather than power um, because it seemed to me like a good way of proving how women are active and influential, even though they don't necessarily have traditional markers of power. So and I think that's what gets a lot of people caught up is they look at the Bene Gesserit and they say, oh, well, they're not that powerful, therefore, you know, we don't really need to look any deeper at what's going on there. Mm-hmm. So a basic definition of agency is the way through which someone exerts power or achieves their goals. And so I took that and I looked at specifically embodied agency, which just means looking at agency in terms of the body. So I focus on the body and I'm looking at how do women have control over their body? How do they have the ability to actively influence events and outcomes and what's going on around them? So you don't necessarily have to be in a position of power or be a powerful figure to have agency or have embodied agency. And so I use this to look at each of those five different areas that I mentioned, such as reproduction. So mm-hmm. looking at, is the body an obstacle for women or is it a way that they can be active and influential in their environment. So that, that's how I kind of got around the issue of 
um, the common critique about the series is, oh, well, the Bene Gesserit aren't, you know, kings and queens or emperors, and therefore, you know, mm. they're always they're always inferior, they're always behind the scenes. But actually, you can have a lot of influence and a lot of agency, even if you're not in a traditional um, place of power. And yeah. I think Herbert was very interested in looking at the non-obvious um, ways that, that people have influence. And so that's that's the framework that I use to look at women. I found it more helpful than looking at do they have equal rights or do they have power? Because that, mm. that's not the kind of universe that Herbert creates. No, it's not at all. It's a very good point. I think I think within the June universe, to me, what was always interesting about it, but in terms of the that we have the Bene Gesserit, which is a, a body, a school of women, if you like, who have complete control, mind and body, at the same time, we've got the Bene Tleilax, the one of the big mysteries, quite quite a horrible mystery. Where are all the Bene Tleilax women? And of course, we've got the exact opposite. They have been completely enslaved to the point of turned into reproductive machines. Um, I have that. It's one of the things that I just thought was absolutely fascinating about the Dune series, um, and that you you have so many different groups showing so many. I suppose so many different ideas. Um, I'll, I'll get, I'll get, my, the question I was wanting to ask you, I was going to ask, but we'll, we'll get to it actually, it's kind of about that. Um, in terms of, uh, let's see, can you tell me a wee bit, actually, I'm, I'm quite fond of feminist science fiction, as, as uh, Cara would know, but I'm not particularly widely read on it. Um, and uh, I suppose the study of the, the science fiction feminism, I think, is particularly interesting. Um, anything that kind of uh, works towards social change, I think, is Particularly, science fiction seems to be a genre that does that very, very well. Could you tell me a wee bit about the second wave of women's liberation and the feminist movement? Um, you you described this as part um, at the time. Is this if I've got this right? Because I'm not very knowledgeable about this. Is this kind of work appearing during this second wave of of uh, feminism? What we call it in America, etc. Yeah. So. What would be the first wave? Sorry. My my oh first wave is the the right uh, suffrage trying to get the right Su vote. suffrage yeah. So that was um, like eighteen hundreds up until usually around World War One is uh -huh. when um, in the U S and the U K and other places. And then we that see was, that's considered first. Well, okay. First wave. Yeah. The wave definition not everyone agrees with, but for for most people I think it, it's helpful. First wave is suffrage trying to get the right to vote. Yeah. And then second wave is. Um, in general, um, simplified version, it's a movement that began in the 1960s and women were continuing the fight that had begun in, in earlier movements such as, um, you know, they had the right to vote, okay, but now it's about, well, what next, right? Just getting the right to vote didn't suddenly mean that everything became, you know, great. Mm. So they were fighting for equal rights still, they were fighting for representation in government and other places and to discrimination, you know. Stop, uh, stopping treating women like they were inferior, they were fighting for reproductive rights, and just in general, a right to make decisions about themselves and their body and have control, and I'd like to sum it up. Mm. So it's, it's, it's more complex than we often hear about, um, as I found when I was reading primary sources of the time, and many of the pieces that I read from the 60s and 70s still have a lot of truth today. Unfortunately, they yeah. sound like they could have been written recently with, with a few tweaks. And so this, this movement is generally considered to have started in the U.S., um, I would say, but it, it also had repercussions around the world and, and, and inaugurated other waves of movements as women just demanded more. Mm. So we want more. You know, we want to have what everyone else has and we don't want to be treated unfairly anymore. And so this period interested me because... Of, yes, it was happening around the same time as science fiction was going through changes in the genre and when the Dune series was being written. So I see the fact that the Dune series is set in the same universe and is published over 20 years is a really great case study for looking at how one person, one science fiction author, changed and developed ideas about women across 20 years when all of this was going on in, in popular culture. And, and I actually think because Herbert was researching and writing it before the second wave actually started flourishing, that he anticipated some of the things that women would end up fighting for, like control over the body. Mm. You know, he gives that to women in the first book before the feminist movement really taken off. 
and, and I think he should be given credit for that. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, as, as we pointed out, I live in a society that's not very good to women at all. Uh, we've, we've just been described in one of the local papers as the most dangerous place to be. Northern Ireland is the most dangerous place to be a woman in Europe. So it's another win for us here. And of course, we've, we've had a kind of um, a cull is the only word to describe it of female politicians recently. Um, absolute bonkers, to be honest with you. So um, as a person who's raised by two women, <clears throat> as I often point out, uh, you know, I'm quite appalled by my own culture and wish they'd read read more. I think they could do a reading your book, Cara, to be honest with you. Um, why do you think the Bene Gesserit aren't uh, handled in a particular way, uh, aren't talked about so much in science fiction if they're of so... I mean, they're fascinating to me and I think they're fascinating to a lot of people. What is it about... Uh, I suppose it's maybe June as well, but what's it about the Bene Gesserit that... Hmm, why are they being neglected if they're so important? <coughs> yeah, this is something I think a lot about. Um, I think... If we look at other science fiction, it's possible that because the women aren't portrayed as being equal or doing all the same things as male characters, that's one reason. Um, Herbert is very subtle mm. in his <laughs> in his work in general, and I, their abilities and their skills are very understated in the novels, and I think people miss them. You know, if they're not kind of paying attention. Mm. Um, uh, there's Taoist elements in the order that can be unfamiliar to readers. Uh -huh. uh, certainly unfamiliar to me, that makes them seem more passive. Um, I think there's, a, yeah, in the Western culture, we have an idea that, you know, to be strong is to do this, or to be influential is, is to do this, or is to look this way. And I think they're not, they're not that drastically different from real women, because they're still having children, they're still raising children, they're still marrying men. So it, it might seem like, oh, there's nothing to see here, but I think they're fascinating, and there's a lot to unpack if you get past, again, the idea that they're not in traditional leadership positions, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that someone mm. has a lot of agency. Um, mm. I also think um, they're part, they're not actually religious, but they take on the guise of religion. And I think it's poten potentially harder for people in our world now, which has become quite secular and individualistic, to grasp the idea that you could be part of a collective or part of a group and give up your own personal desires for a greater good or for the goals of the group. Mm. And there's a lot of strategic sacrifice that the Bene Gesserit go through. And I think this rubs up against our notion that you should always think about yourself first as an individual. And we might be seeing a shift with this in terms of response to climate change, which kind of demands more of that collective action rather than thinking of just about yourself. Mm. Um, but I think that's one of the challenges is People look at the Bene Gesserit and they say, oh, well, they have to follow the rules of the order or they have to do something that doesn't go against their own personal wishes. Therefore, they're, you know, being controlled by someone else and they're not very influential <laughs> or we should dismiss them. But, I mean, there's a lot of groups that ask you once you join to, you know, give up some of your individualistic tendencies or your wishes for the greater good. And so that's potentially another reason why people don't see them as as very strong characters. Uh, I think I think the misconception there is that the Bene Gesserit fundamentally understand that sitting on a throne is the most dangerous place to be. And uh, mm -hmm. the, the desire to create a Kwisatz Sadrach, which ultimately is going to be a weapon uh, that they intend to wield, well, they intend to put that Kwisatz Sadrach on the throne and stand behind it <laughs> as it destroys everything in front of it. That is their pretty much intent, and regardless of, I think, how the different families are aiming for the throne. The Bene Gesserit's uh, breeding program is lining up with doesn't really matter who's getting the throne. It's whether it's the Atreides, or, I mean the Atreides are going for it, the Harkonnens are going for it generationally. Everybody's after the throne and they're the only people that aren't after it. They're, ha they're the power behind the throne, which is the real power. And as I said, the, the, the nature of power within Jun, it, a lot of people don't get that. It's, it's uh, you know, they are powerful by not taking the throne. It's it's the one, you know, and if you think about poor old Shaddam IV, and, uh, you know, his, his five daughters, uh, his desire to have a male child has been, when I mean, you're talking about control over uh, our body, women's bodies, etc., but the, the, the desire of a man to have what he wants in terms of his children, no, he doesn't get it. He gets five daughters and all the, again, part of the breeding program. I, I think that that's, 
how the Bene Gesserit are particularly clever, uh, smarter than everyone else. Um, as, I, as I often said, the, the only thing that, that, that goes wrong for the Bene Gesserit is the thing that goes wrong for everybody in the Dune universe. It's part, part of uh, Frank's little subtleties is that I think, as I put it, everybody who's working with agency, if you like, in the Dune universe to act on, on a certain set of ideals or to get a set of goals happening or whatever, they don't realise how these things affect themselves, that, that ultimately there's feedback. And I th the, the, the point that the, the, the failure in the Bene Gesserit thinking is that they don't understand how their breeding programme affects them, but it's the, it's the one shared fault of everybody. In the Dune universe, every organisation doesn't really understand long-term consequences or or the or or the I suppose there was you know the the actions that will feed back upon them. You know I think they it's think that they can stand outside of and direct things. Yeah, but yeah. not not be touched themselves. But yep. I like, know, said, they're, yeah, they're all wrong. <laughs> unfortunately, that's that. <laughs> I often that, as you were saying it, it's uh, the way I would put it is whenever Frank's working. And you think, this, look at this, look at this, this is the real big problem. Shh, there it goes, that's the really danger, the thing you're not paying attention to. Um, I, I think it's fantastic. Um, and particularly, that's, it's, it's one of the main reasons why I love Frank Herbert's work, is that it's the random, he likes to throw in the random, the thing that you'll not see coming. And he likes to you know, have a look at this, have a look at Dazzy, and it's, it's very subtle, I think. And it, it, it leads to all sorts of what's going to happen in book seven, I suppose. Um, in, in terms of your work and your, your new book, um, do would people need to have read all the six June books to get this? Or uh, would, they, would they have need to see a film? Or how, how accessible would it be to them if they haven't read all six June books? So I, I try to make it accessible. So I have a brief summary of all the books in my introduction chapter. And... Those summaries really focus on what's important to know about the Bene Gesserit, so they're not the summary of everything that happens. Mm. And there is a lot of fo focus in my book on the first Dune book because uh -huh. that's where the world building happens. That's yes. where Jessica is introduced to us and where she's developed. And I think she's our main window into the Bene Gesserit for the first part of the series. So there's a lot of focus on her. I do use examples from the later books to show here's how the order is developing, here's some new abilities that Herbert throws in that they that they have. But all of these are explained in the context of the chapter focus area. Because I recognize many people haven't made it to the last two books, mm -hmm. um, but this is when women take center stage and then there's a rival all-female group to contrast against the Bene Gesserit. Yeah, they honored so, yeah, the so It's more of, um, I focus on the, the first book because that's where a lot of the good stuff is and then kind of case study examples from the later books so you don't have to have read all the books to to understand the ideas because there's a lot of contextualization that happens in each chapter that's yeah. what i would say excellent no as I, I i sometimes i look at i used to look at the june books as two trilogies and i don't look at them that way at all anymore i look at them as a set of uh, three sets of two if you like the june and june messiah and then Children of June, God Emperor, and then the two Bene Gesserits, Bene Gesserit books. And I often, th I, th I think about, is it, uh, is it Donald E. Palumbo? Who are we talking about? Ah, right, with the, the chaos theory. Oh, the monomyth. Yeah, and yeah, the reiteration yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, uh, of action and so on. And uh, I've often, uh, uh, that's why I spend so much time thinking about, well, what, it, what, what the seventh book would have been like. And as I said, it's the Bene Gesserit are heading, they're driving all of pretty much the action um, how the, and particularly how things evolve in the Dune universe, you know, and it's just such a uh, cliffhanger. Well, ah, uh, no, and I think I think a lot of us, not to offend anybody in the Brian Herbert, Kevin J. Anderson camp, I think a lot of us are deeply dissatisfied with the conclusion to Dune. I've never seen so many Deus Ex Machinas in one book. I'm not quite impressed actually. I think five or six at the end. I'm totally impressive, you know. How does the Dune series and the depiction of women fit into the broader history of science fiction? Yeah, so this is this is another contextualization that I do in the book. Um, again, simplifying, but in general, science fiction has been classified by scholarship into broad categories or trends. Mm -hmm. So there's Golden Age, which is 1940s up until around 1960, which is kind of your classic Asimov um, stories. And there's the New Wave, which... Dune fits into from the 60s and the 70s, mm -hmm. 
And then usually around the 1980s is when we get like cyberpunk, um, kind of like uh, the Matrix is based off of Neuromancer. So not everything fits into these neat groupings, but those are kind of general trends of, of the change. And feminist science fiction really took off, as you would expect, around the same time as the feminist movement in the 60s and 70s. Mm. So you had stories like only having women in the story or having women and men living in separate societies and you know fighting each other or being rivals or some kind of conflict between those. There was stories that talked about um, babies being born in artificial environments and having non-nuclear families raising them. You know, that was that was something that women were um, you know kind of experimenting and writing about. And so they they were looking at gender, sexism, and oppression in new ways, is pretty yeah. much what feminist science fiction was all about. And they were also speculating about what might society look like in a different future. You know, what if this weren't true, or what if this were obstacle were removed for women? So looking at Dune, so Dune has been previously considered to be the start of the modern period of science fiction, and this is when it kind of started moving and becoming more complex and having more literary nature and more widespread popularity beyond just um, a small minority of fans. So around the same time, the Star Trek was coming out mm. and things were exposing more people to this genre. So what I say in the book is that Dune should be recognized for its depiction of women, especially coming out early in the 60s, and that it has several, several similarities to feminist science fiction, and it gives women a lot of skills and abilities that were beyond what was currently possible and still is currently possible. And so that's how I situate Dune in that. It's part of the new wave. It had some, you know, becoming more literary, but it also did some really cool things with the female characters, and it should be recognized that, even if it doesn't look the same as other feminist science fiction of the period. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I've always considered it, uh, especially, especially with the involvement of Bev, um, Herbert, Frank's wife, I think, within the, you know, that's actually what I was going to ask you, but I'll keep it for you. But I wanted to ask you what if you, I'll talk to you a bit about it later. We've got another big question for, but it was just about Bev's input. I'm, I'm very curious to know if you know anything about that. Into the, I understand that Benny Jesuit, a lot of her is in them, if you know what I mean. <coughs> um, Frank Herbert's wife. Um, I'm often wondering how much did he turn to her or how much is his own, if you see what I mean. Um, just in terms of our, our formal questions to get us through that, what do you think uh, people would find most interesting for Dune fans from your book? So I, I think people would be interested in looking at the series from this new perspective and especially the historical perspective of what was happening with women in American society around the same time mm. as opposed to how we might look at it today or how it might have been viewed at the time. Um, I know lots of people have read Dune and they didn't see anything special about the Bene Gesserit or they thought, oh, they're just working behind the scenes. And as I said, I, I didn't think much about the Eastern elements like Taoism or other ways of perceiving the world before I started researching it. And I think another thing that I do is I compare the Bene Gesserit with some of the other groups or uh -huh. other characters like the Mentats and the Bene Tleksu. And, and these other groups have really hardly been looked at at all. And so I... I, I put them up against each other to, to draw some comparisons and some contrast mm -hmm. that, that I found were interesting because I think looking at them in relationship with other characters can really help highlight this is what Herbert was trying to show or this is a theme that comes across in terms of how they work versus how some of the, the male characters work. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Uh, yeah. Um. Oh, was I thinking? Oh, so I had a train of thought there, and I've just, I've just lost it. But I'll tell you, what, I'll go to the next question. What are your plans for your next works on June? Great. Yeah. So I have a couple of chapters on the Benny Jesuit. Um, I'm still similar topic but a little bit different um, in terms of focus, and those will be coming out in edited collections that have other people's works in the next couple of years. Uh -huh. uh, my, my big project is I'm finishing up a second book on June. And that's going to be more of a general guidebook to just the first book um, for general audiences as well as students studying at the university. Uh -huh. And again, just like this book, it was hard to choose which areas do you focus on, what's most important to talk about when you have limited uh, space. Mm. Um, but I'm hoping it all comes together and really gives an interesting introduction to how the book has really stood the test of time 
and that it really still has a lot to offer modern audiences. It's not just a classic that used to be. It's it's still some something that has um, a lot of a lot of new things to give and and can be read in a new way. You know, in the twenty first century. Mm. Well, I I agree. I think I. I I think it's interesting that Dune has longevity, and I think a lot of science fiction books do not. And I, I think I think the main problem for a lot of readers is that I think science fiction arguably is about the now rather than the future. And whenever we move forward a bit, we tend to when we look back at older science fiction, we understand that that now didn't happen, and um, that it's not real. And so some science fiction tends to to almost be seen as fantasy. I, I mean. Uh, is uh Gulliver Jones those or hang on, my, who am I thinking of? Uh, the Mars Mars stories, the Edgar Rice Burroughs things, those kind of things have 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 dated quite badly. Um, and I suppose the ideas from them came on as novels, observations of canals on Mars, which turned out to not be true, etc. So some some science, I, I don't read it that way at all. I'm very easy, very happy to put myself back in that time and read science fiction as if it's contemporary, but a lot of people can't do that. And therefore, sometimes it just seems dated or antiquated. And that there's something about Dune that, it, that it, it has this kind of dated, antiquated feel because of the Butlerian Jihad. If you see what I mean, that, that it, it sometimes it can have the feel of something like out of the Arabian Nights almost, you know, almost like a fantasy story. And also because it's unfinished, I think that's why, I also think that's got great, gives it great longevity, you know. Um, I said, I, I'm, I'm a person that enjoys reading a lot of ancient literature and all, loads of it's unfinished, it's fragmented um, there's bits missing here, bits missing there and that's kind of what I really like about it because you get to go, hmm oh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's no finite ending to some of these things you know, and I, I have to say it's, it, it is a book, I mean I don't know I've lost track of how many times I've read June now and as, as I point out to people I, I find I get quite hard pressed to come back to the books because I've read them so much, um, but I'll, I'll, we've, this is kind of the end of our formal questions. But I will, I will just say this to you that um, myself and Cara have agreed on one thing, and we chatted about this: that whenever you do a PhD, they say you should do it on something you love, but that you'd probably hate it by the time you've finished it. And we've both discussed this; that it's not the case. We both still, you know, love the source material, and it hasn't driven us mad. Um, you know, and that we're both quite happy to return to Frank Herbert's Dune universe as much as I'm, my main problem is I've got lots of other things to read. <coughs> Excuse me. And it does, you know, Frank Herbert's not, a, he's not a small read. Um, you know, there's plenty, as I said, it takes you a wee while to get through it. But it, it is, uh, having just read the first Dune book again recently for the film, I loved it. And um, I still think it's a very tightly written book. Um, I, I just don't see it as being able to age well at all in, in, or, you know, um, in people's imaginations. I think it'll stay fresh for a long time, I have to say. But it's, I just always find that interesting that I've talked to a lot of people who've done PhDs and, and certain things and they don't ever want to look at it again. They're done. Leave me alone. It was a nightmare, this kind of thing. And uh, just, just to say that we both, we both really enjoyed our work and, and looking at these books in a particular way. Um, so thank you very much, Carol. I hope we didn't make too much of a hash of this. Uh, this is our first attempt at these things, and we're all a bit informal and a bit doolally here, as I like to say. I've got a whole ton of comments and stuff over here, uh, so uh, if you don't mind, I'll open things up a wee bit to the, our audience. Yeah, and see it, what it sounds saying. like there's some people are having some issues with the streaming. But... Oh, well, we're all good. We've been running live. There is a wee bit of a delay, uh, but let's see. I'm just going to back up here. So for everybody who's uh, been chatting away, uh, I'll just back up and read through a few of the comments and we can take a pause whenever we get to a question if we see. So uh, let's just see, we'll go through, this is what we usually just, how we interact with people here. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, so we've got everybody so excited, something, <laughs> that's just Babs's connection in Ohio. She, uh, Babs's connection dies quite a bit, I think. Uh, so we have Marcia Biderman saying, happy book launch, Cara. And uh, Mika, uh, oh, I need to bring this closer. These glasses aren't cutting it. Let me just see. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So that's uh, Mika CG says, Hi Cara, super excited for you. So we've got a bunch of greetings here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Must be on my hand, says Bob. There we go. Tales from the Throne World by Hilary S. Webb, PhD, says, Love your background, Cara. 
And uh, people says, yay, Cara, you get lots of love here tonight, Cara. <laughs> There we go. Uh, by the way, folks, if anybody, if any of you do have any questions for myself or Kara, type away now. Now's the time, and we'll we'll do our best to answer them if we can. Uh, just reading through a few more comments. So we've got Marsha Marsha. So glad to be with you for this, Kara. Marsha Jacobson. Um, Karen Rule says, so happy to be here for your book launch. So hope I'm not mispronouncing anybody's names, by the way, folks, and I hope you don't mind my Northern Irish accent too much. Uh, Bows Bows, wow. Looking, look, it's just ladies watching. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Dan says, congrats, Cara. Do, 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 do. Congrats, Cara. Way to go from Colin Bjork. Uh, Battles Battle. Dang, Doc, you give me some new warm fuzzies here, whatever that means. <laughs> uh, from Babs. Victoria Nose says, Con congratulations, Cara. Joseph Smith, Jin fan, congrats. Goodness gracious, we've got lots of love here tonight. Karen Ruels, congrats. Uh, Babs Bilo, not sure I'd consider 1984 a science fiction novel. Ooh, well, that's one for another time, Babs. <coughs> uh, Stephen Campbell, hi Stevie, hi Doc, hi Cara, hi Alt, hi Stevie, thanks for joining us. Thank you for the chat earlier, sir. Much appreciated. Uh, Cynthia Greenwood says, I'm so excited for you, Cara, congratulations. Do 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 do. Uh, how do you do? Such a good way to describe it. Okay, Doc Sloan. Thanks for being an ally. Oh, okay. From Marcia. Okay, Doc Sloan. Exclamation mark. Thanks for being an ally of women. No problem at all. <laughs> as, as much as we've, we've discussed this, my, my basic philosophy for anybody who doesn't know anybody who doesn't know me online is I come from a classical. I come from lots of different backgrounds. I'm a, a classicist and a computer scientist, and a philosopher and a linguist, etc., etc. But uh, I'm, I, my main philosophy in life is isonomia, uh, which is, is what most people pretend to call their democracies as far. Is what, isonomia is what democracy should be, and it simply means equal law uh, for everyone, for all. And I suppose that's feminism as well, isn't it? So that's, that's my philosophy. But thank you very much, Marcia. Um, uh, you don't need to thank me for being an ally of women. It's just just seems a natural thing to me. Uh, Brad Rose, yep, safer to be a king maker than a king. Absolutely. Congratulations, says Christine Yard. Carol Blessing, are others having problems with the streaming continuously rebooting, or is it just my end? There might be a bit of a bother here. Uh, I'm not too sure, Carl. Everything seems to be running fine here, but uh, we have a bit of a lag, and this is the, this is the first time we've ever actually done this. So, uh, uh, Carol sort of got plenty of warnings that it might all go, ah, in which case we've been hopefully recording it and we would get it all to you anyway. Uh, we are going to be putting some links, etc., for Cara's book in the description. Uh, once the, we put this feedback up on the station, it'll be staying there permanently, and we'll get that updated with information for the book. And I think uh, I'll get Cara to tell us a bit about it in a second, just as I finish these last week comments. Uh, Christine, you know, my phone is buffering up, but that may be just where I am. Congratulations, Cara. Uh, yeah, it seems a. Uh, on the feed is doing better now there we go so that's us caught up to date with those comments if anybody does have a wee question for us far away and uh, uh we've, we've got about a minute delay i think but we'll definitely uh we'll definitely do our best to answer them um what i was going to ask you actually Carl. well just just if you don't mind i've always been curious about this what could you if you know anything about it do you know much about bev's Beverly Herbert's um, input into the, the creation of the Bene Gesserit, or could you tell me a little if you, if you do know? Yeah, yeah I, did I did try to find this out. out. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put, put a biographical um, perspective, perspective in, in this book because there just wasn't room and it's, it's hard and you get into death of the author kind of things. But I have been looking at it now for the second book and there's vague references to her helping review manuscripts and she would type them up and kind of feed suggestions. And Brian Herbert, uh, their son, has commented that he, or that she helped Herbert out with aspects of characterization, particularly the motivational aspects of female characters. And I think it's one of those cases as with many writing couples, I'm um, sure Bev was also a writer, uh, that we're never, we're never going to know exactly how much of her is in his work, but I would say based on the characters that we can see and based on the Bene Gesserit, there's definitely a strong influence from her as well as his 10 maternal aunts who yeah. really wanted him to be um, 
go through Catholic, Catholic education. education. And, and I, I think, think you can, can see those, those strong, strong, strong women in your life kind of coming through uh, this book. Now, of course, that's, that doesn't always happen. There's other writers who have strong female influences and don't put that in their book. Mm. But I can't see how that wouldn't have affected Herbert's writing. And I think, I think Herbert has alluded to um, Bev as the white witch in, mm -hmm. in an interview. And right. I think I think we can see Lady Jessica as being modeled off of her in terms of, you know, a, a motherly figure who's also, you know, has very, a very strong will and knows exactly what's going on and and gives her that, that three dimensionality that you don't see in a lot of other science fiction. And that for me is part of Part of why Dune has stood the test of time is because the characters are well developed, or at least some of them, and they're interesting, and we get to be inside their heads, and they have motivations, and they have struggles, and and they're not just kind of there so that you can learn about the technology. Because Herbert wasn't really interested in the technology; he was interested in humans, mm. and how do humans work, and how do we think, and how do we process stuff, and. Oh, so and I, that, I, that's that's rare. That's rare to to you know to have a have go inside you know female characters' heads, especially at that time, and have a realistic person come out of it who yeah. doesn't just seem really you know like like she is based on archetypes. He did use archetypes in his work, mm -hmm. but he took the archetypes as a starting place. I think he didn't end with the archetype. He started with the archetype and, and drew it out and fleshed it out more. Yeah, he's, he uses Jungian mandalas as well, and uh, but he's, he's heavily invested in his archetypes. And I think Alia is a character that fits into so many of them. Um, you know, uh, but you know, was it the, is it got the heart of virgin um, part of the syzygy, this kind of thing? Um, uh, I, 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 I'll give you. Oh, tell you what, sorry, Cara, I've got a question for you here. I'm not. I'll, much as I don't want to hog, hog this actually here. So here's a good, uh, apparently I'm mispronouncing some people's names. Uh, we'll have a week off, just say here. So we've got to, uh, I do apologize folks. Um, I'll have, I wish I knew how to do it correctly. Uh, Karen Ruel, I hope that's not too bad. Karen says, what's your next favorite science fiction book, series or author? Oh, that's a hard question. They're telling me they like my accent though. <laughs> so after June, what would it be? It's a tricky one, isn't it? There's Keith Cole saying, greetings. Hi, Keith. Thanks for joining Yeah, me. I mean, yeah. I do, I do, I probably would say more fantasy than sci-fi. Um, Just a favorite book after June, though, I suppose. <laughs> you can have no other favorite book once, once you go to. <laughs> I disagree. I think you can. I like the the Golden Compass, Philip Pullman's the the Golden Compass. Yes. Um, which they recently uh, made into a, a TV series. I really like that. I read that around the same time as Dune, and I really like that. I I have been meaning to reread it um, uh, as an adult. Haven't had a chance to. Well, but you've, you've read there's it also again. a lot of layered layered themes and dealing with religion and and that kind of religious order. Yeah. Um, it's more obvious, isn't it? I think um, I've, I've only read it as an adult. I have to say, but I, I got lots of Milton in it. I think, um, but it's, it's I find it hard to comprehend it as a children's book. Um, I think uh, are the well, I guess it's that, that struggle of kind of being a young person who's misunderstood, and you know, as they usually do, they have to go on a journey, and there's some issue with the parents. Like they're all uh -huh. a lot of them follow that line, and it just. When you're feeling like that as a young person, I think it's comforting to kind of read about other other people are at least getting out and getting to explore, even if you're not. Mm. And, um, for myself, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a bit like yourself. I don't like favorites. I, I kind of have uh, a lot of my favorite books are very, very old. Um, but I, I um, Ian, do... Ian Banks is also more uh, modern science fiction I really like. Yeah, I, I, actually, there you go. We, we've both come up with it. Well, my favourite set of stories outside the junior, probably the culture books today. Prior to that, I don't know, I would have said um, probably Dan Simmons, Hyperion, Can't Lose Our Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun, something like that. But otherwise, my favourite book would be 
the Anabasis, probably. <laughs> there you go, by Xenophon. So I, I like a good march up country. But um, the books like that read like a fantasy book to me. Well, I think to me they read like Greek civilization, but to other people, I think they would read like fantasy novels, you know. Marcia ba uh, Biederman, Biederman, I don't know which Marcia, uh, it could be Marcia, I'm so sorry. Um, you're mispronouncing my name, but I'm enjoying your accent. That's okay, then we're not too bad. <laughs> He said, we've got a question from Carol Blessing. Um, why do you think Herbert chose to have Jessica have a male child rather than only featuring females? Does that show Bene Gesserit influence on males as well as females? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is always the question, right? Like, that comes up where people say, oh, well, but Jessica had a boy, and so therefore, you know, showing boys are better um, why the quiz of Hadrock had to be a male there's there's kind of different threads to this there's looking at the the medieval kind of feudal culture or the environment and the setting is that um, primogenitor males being preferred in terms of having heirs right you mentioned the emperor is deprived of having a male heir by the Bene Gesserit, which leaves open the possibility of, of a certain alliance with one of the daughters. The and yeah. but I think it makes sense within within the setting that Leto would want to have a male to carry on the male line, right? So that's kind of just like how the society was. And Herbert was also really interested in the Jungian and the kind of masculine and feminine yes. kind of is the, the yin and yang and the, the dual. The syzygy. So, yeah. So, but the thing is, he's not consistent with, oh, only females can only do this and, and males can only do this. And, um, you know, even, even when Jessica's going through the really dangerous water of life ceremony, the, the other reverend mother says, this would have been fatal to a male fetus so there's kind of sometimes sometimes the male is considered stronger but then sometimes the female is considered stronger and people usually would just look at the examples of the male and they'll kind of dismiss or forget about the other times when herbert shows the females actually being stronger in different circumstances so and 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 looking at looking outside the text what was herbert interested in he was interested in looking at why do people follow these leaders these messiah figures and in, in our history, well, like the Western history, it's, it's mostly been, well, pretty much always males, right? It's like Lawrence of Arabia or um, the prophets, prophets out of Islam, prophets out of Christianity and Judaism, right? So he could have, he could have put a female there, but I don't think it would have worked for what he was trying to show. He was trying to show the danger in, in heroes and you know, up until that time, also today, you know, it'd most likely be to be a male figure that would be kind of going in that way. But yeah, the, her follow up question, does that show Benitez or influence on males as well as females? So what I talk about in my book is, yes, sometimes they have males for whatever reason, you know, and we can argue about whether that's a good idea, but when they have male children, they then raise them Bene Gesserit, right? And they raise them to think in their ways and to act in their ways, even when Paul rejects them, He's still, he's still a product of yeah, that upbringing, right? He can't ever get rid of pretty much being a Bene Gesserit and, and understanding and thinking in that way. And so to me, that really is a sign of the mothering that happens. It's not just about reproduction and the breeding program. It's also about how do you mother those children once they come into the world? And they're mothered by Bene Gesserit women who craft and mold them according to you know that order and 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 if we look at biographically herbert was you know raised by all these women and, and all these aunts and he went to jesuit education even though he, he rejected catholicism in terms of practicing he could never escape that upbringing and that education as i think a lot of us can can relate to right like how you're raised when you're little even if you know as an adult hey that doesn't make sense anymore or hey i don't really agree with that it imprints on you in a way that you can never be rid of. And so that's what the Bene Gesserit influence is. Once you, once you are part of that, you can't ever become not part of it, even if you reject um, being controlled by them or reject obeying those orders. So that, that for me is, it's more complicated than just, yes, she did out of love, 
but she also wanted to have the Kuza Kadarak. You know, she had her own selfish reasons as well that I think people don't talk about. And you have to read that dialogue that she has with the Reverend Mother, but she says, you know, this is about your selfish desires. And Jessica has that pride. You know, I think that I could do this. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> That's, funny That's not just a woman, a woman kowtowing to male society. Yeah. There's, there's more going on there. There's the famous quote from Gorgo, isn't it? That only Spartan women produce Spartan men. If you see what I mean, it's only Spartan women produce Spartan warriors. I used to say only Northern Irish women produce Northern Irish terrorists as well. But there you go. But it's particularly the Miles Tag character, I think, is he... So I think that's probably the strongest thing I remember from is that you've got here you have the the Bene Gesserit and you know um, at this point that they've got this 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 general this Bashar who's a man and you kind of go huh oh, you know why what what's that about why not why not one of them as a general and it, and as you as you say it's a man who's raised Bene Gesserit he thinks Bene Gesserit you know. And um, maybe it's also got something to do with, well, yeah, we'd rather be behind you. Send a man out to do the fighting, I'm not quite sure. But it, it, it's, um, I think it is a very interesting point. And we sometimes talk about this, particularly it's a thing, I think, in Hollywood, the idea of what a strong woman is. Um, and we've talked about what strong female characters are in literature. It's nothing to do with you know, are shooting and blowing things up like the guys. It's not that kind of strength. It's, it's um, you know, and when I talk about strong characters, it's they're fleshed out, they're real, they're as real as the men. They're, they stand out, they're vibrant. There's, that's a real, that's a strong character to me. It, the, the idea that strong women have to be, you know, uh, I don't know if I think I that's have to a be men. Idea. Yeah, uh, well, that, that's a good way of putting it. I have to be masculine. Yeah. 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 And I think that's that's often the same thing to do with power. To be honest, the, the, I think power, the nature of power is very much sometimes, depending on how we look at it, a, a very much male thing. And it's, I often find it a wee bit funny, maybe, you know, we used to talk about was it the Spice Girls with girl power. And I, th I thought, mm, okay, girl power, what does it mean by that? Do you want to go out and oppress people the same way the men do? <laughs> it's the, you know, in terms of government and this kind of thing. And I just thought, no, power's not the thing. You know, it's a, power corrupts absolute, power corrupts absolutely. What was it Herbert said? Power, he said something like it doesn't corrupt, it merely attracts the corruptible. Something like that, mm, I think, yeah. you know. Of a few more comments here, Carol, I'll just uh, read through them here as we were getting there. Uh, let's see, because... Yeah, I think, I think, I, think, I, think I mean, it's not, it's, it's not, not necessarily, necessarily fleshed out in Dune, Dune but in Dune, Dune Messiah, Messiah, and I don't, I don't know, know if Herbert just kind of changed his mind on this, but... but you can, you can see, see that it kind of seems like, like Alia could, could have become a Kwisak Haderach because she, she is able to tap into some prescience, you know, and she has she has struggles with her identity because of, um, you know, Jessica taking the water of life when she did. But it's it's just it's not as I guess when I was researching for that section in the book, it was not as cut and dry as I initially thought of who has access to prescience and who doesn't. Um, it's a, it's a bit murky, murky. and it so is. so it's yeah. possible that the Bene Gesserit were wrong, and it didn't have to be a male. Um, but, but that's, that's potentially, potentially something that Herbert came to later, or again one of those ambiguities in the text. Um, mm. I, th I think but, Ali is yeah. Ali is the character that presents so many problems there. That uh, to me is probably one of the most interesting characters in the whole series. I um, I think Ali is an amazing character. Um, and, and I think because we, we see her transition from hero to villain almost, but the whole nature of her other memory is because with the and of course we have this the this personality of the Baron Harkonnen contained in her mind, and that just raises oh okay what what's he doing there? Why is it a male? If this is meant to be from her other memory and uh, you know the the idea that personalities come to the fore and take over a personality, what's he doing there? She only has the female. Other memory, and I've actually we've discussed yeah. this. We've had some really incredible responses to this. That uh, the Baron was a hermaphrodite. It, it, all all sorts of things. It's just to try and logically make sense of it. And as you say, Frank doesn't really explain everything. And you know, some I think there are wee threads that we're just a wee bit lost on. I think sometimes, but I, I think Alia's character in particular, it, it's hard to sort of. And, and it is meant to be a kind of, you know, it is a syzygy with Paul, you know, that they're meant to be this kind of Apollo and Artemis 
the sun and the moon you know this almost divine representations of uh you know um and that of course links into them their dad being called Leto <laughs> but um I I, I find I, I, something I was going to ask you actually about some of the female characters um I'll read a couple of these wee comments first but I, I I'll, I'll maybe actually so I'll tell you what I'll say this first do you think some of the female characters are just abandoned in, in the June series just dropped and oh like Margot Margot Margo Margo Fenring uh-huh uh, well, the only one I was thinking of was Ganima as well. Um, uh, whereas Alia should be an equal to Paul. Ganima should be a, an equal, in a sense, to, to Leto II. And, and uh, as much as we all love the God Emperor of June, I was really gutted when I read it to find that she wasn't there. You know, that she might have gone along on this journey with him or something, you know. But it was, uh, 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 to me, oh, the really fast, that that's the... And uh, Margot Fenring, is that the last we see her is that she's headed off Possible, if I, I can't remember, but she's she's left. Pre oh, is she pregnant with Fade Ruth's child? I believe that that that's the whole point of going to see the, the Baron on you know, it's, it's to that's the backup for the line, isn't it? Um, I I think it's fascinating. Uh, yeah, but uh, as I said, Ali and yeah, Margot Fenning, what a character, and um, well, it's her and Hazemir, her husband, just turn up. And uh, I think they're I think they're two of the most interesting characters in the whole June series, and we get to see so little of them. And uh, if anybody doesn't know what we're talking about, whenever the you get to the final confrontation in June, um, Fade Ruth is not really the danger. It's it's Hazemir Fenring, um, who's seen as a field, a potential quiz at Sarah, isn't it? He's a genetic eunuch, I believe, and that's why he, he's not. But uh, uh, and of course, him and his Benny Jesuit wife, that they're a very interesting couple. And I often thought, is it, um, if I can remember correctly, I don't remember much about these books, but when Maz Tegg talks about his parents, I think, is it Locks Losky Tegg and um, Janet, or oh, maybe getting the name wrong, Roxborough, is it? I yeah. often I often get a mental picture of Hazemir and uh, Margot Fenning whenever he's talking about it. They seem almost like a, yeah, I said we lose these characters early on, but you know, I think sometimes Frank Herbert likes to come back, come back to things, and of course he's well known for bringing back dead characters. You know, I will run through. We were running a wee bit uh, ahead here, Car, so I'll, I'll just go back up with a few of the comments and questions, because <coughs> um, they were just following on. Um, we have a bit of dialogue in here. Uh, let's see. So Carol was saying yes, but Herbert could have written it differently, and Bob's was felt the possibilities that of this child being the requisite son because she told Bohem on Paul's test day. So we're just running a few wee comments here, Cara. I see your point, but a girl child could never be the quiz at Sadarak. Um, Carol's saying, I guess my point is that feminine has to do more, has to do more than influence women. Karen Real saying, perfect. I think, was that about, <laughs> possibly about my pronunciation, yeah? Um, say to people, pronunciation's a guide, uh, I have to say. There's, There's a lot of arguments about uh, how to pronounce quiz at Sadarak and all sorts of things online. Uh, as I, I, I point out, you know, how you pronounce things is entirely depends on the shape of your mouth, if you've got any teeth, all sorts of factors. You just can't make people say certain things, you know. Um, yeah, we've got a wee comment here, Cam, yes, Pullman is fabulous. I've, I've got the last, no, it's not the last, but probably I've got the little, it's a, oh, it's a very small short book with a little map and stuff in it. I can't remember, I haven't read it yet. But I read the first three, um, oh, the, the original, uh, his Dark Materials series. Was anyone, let's see, Marshall Jacobson saying, was anyone writing anything similar at the same time he started in June? Hmm. In terms of scale, J.R.R. Tolkien was the only one really, I think, attempting or did, did write a long kind of epic, but that was in fantasy. But... Mm -hmm. So Dune is considered the kind of equivalent in science fiction in terms of world building, yeah. and I, yeah, it's it's when you read when you read Dune and then you read kind of some other things that were coming out at the same time. I mean, to me, there's just no comparison in terms of what Herbert was doing, and I think that's why, of all science fiction, you can safely consider Dune as literature because it has the markings of literature and it is very ambitious and it's very complex and it's not a very simple story that you can quickly summarize and move on to the next thing, like some, some stories, but it, it did influence. So the success of Dune then after it showed people, Hey, we could 
we could write something that's super long in science fiction, or we could focus more on this. And, and even though we, we don't necessarily know, you know, all the influence it had, it certainly helped pave the way for other more complex science fiction and longer science fiction and, and those kinds of things. But I, at the time, it was fairly unique, I believe. I mean, yeah. it had to be serialized in multiple installments. You know, it was so long. No one really wanted to touch it because it was so long. But now, now we're just used to, you know, science oh. fiction and fantasy books being very long. God, I'm sick to death, and there's trilogies of trilogies of trilogies. It's, it's the main <laughs> thing that drove me away from fantasy literature. I, I would also say, and I don't know the publication on this date, but generally, um, if anybody's watching, uh, we, we consider June the pinnacle of science fiction, whether it's the deal with Lord of the Rings of fantasy, or high fantasy, if you like. There is another book within the middle sphere, and I'll go with gothic fantasy, if you like, but um, Mervyn Peake's Gorman Gas trilogy. And I'm not too sure of the dates, but um, I think he's probably a bit earlier. And, um, and interestingly enough, I think Peake's one of the... Uh, I've done a bit of work with him recently, I just mentioned him, but Peake is one of those guys that I think is a phenomenal writer. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, it's just... just the, regardless of the story, I mean, um, Titus Groan kind of finishes before its protagonist is two years old. Um, but by God, can that man write? Um, um, I think he was not liked by a lot of certain class of writers, um, and I think he was slagged off. I think I'm thinking. I'm, I think I'm talking about um, what's his name? Mark is it Mark Amos? Kingsley Amos new maps of hell possibly. <coughs> and um, I remember not liking this, but he particularly slagging off Mervyn Peake. Mervyn Peake was adored by the new wave, and. Um, I don't think he lived particularly long, but uh, and I think I don't know too much about him. I think he's a bit of kids, right? But if you have, if anybody hasn't caught uh, the Gorman Gas trilogy, I would say June Gorman Gas trilogy and Lord of the Rings fit well together. But there's you know as in the the peaks of that kind of fiction, but one sci-fi. I don't know what to call Gorman Gas. Um, I'll call Lord of the Rings high fantasy if you want. It's kind of somewhere in between the Gothic, um, fantasy. <coughs> Excuse me, and maybe a little bit of science fiction. Um, I think I was giving off a bit about it the other week, Cara, because uh, the BBC did a radio production of it a long time ago, and Steer Pike, Steer Pike was played by Sting. Um, <laughs> way, around, the, I think way back around then, actually around the early eighties, when Sting's acting abilities weren't. <coughs> Excuse me, that's so hot. Uh, I'm going to take me some of the precious fluids here. That's an ongoing joke in the station. If you can identify the film, well done. <laughs> uh, you've got to protect your precious fluids. Okay. Uh, just a we call it. Uh, Brands, let's see. Brands, I wonder why the bat... So that was Marsha asked that wee question. Thank you, Marsha. Bob saying I often wonder why the bat... You, you can tell Herbert's very interested in reproduction. <laughs> it's, it comes in different different forms throughout the whole series so I wasn't able to cover everything but yeah he's he seemed very very interested in genetics and and that reproduction and and yeah you know, well, actually it becomes quite dominant by the end in terms of the telaxu so it's it's interesting how he makes that a, a major theme that hasn't really been looked at that much in the scholarship when I, when I had a look at I was sort of looking at evolution um, as the dominant theme that would lead to the sex and gender chapter. That's why kind of my work is cut at, at the midpoint almost that's set up the major themes that lead into the lesser ones, you know. And not that they're lesser, and sometimes I think they're, they're quite well intertwined. Um, and as it, people would argue that ecology is meant to be one of the major themes of June, but it pretty much dies out by the time you get through God Emperor of June. Once you get to the Bene Gesserit books, the ecology message is kind of gone and that's why I went with evolution as the dominant theme because it's there from the beginning and it's, it's right there at the very end you know um, let's just have a look I don't remember the Ben Jesuit didn't go to feed on Alia to get what they sought according to their plan says Babs that's a good one sorry I'll read that a wee bit later uh, Babs was saying it was a, in relation to another comment there at Brad I often wonder why the Bene Gesserit didn't go to feed on Alia to get what they sought according to their plan Quite an interesting comment. We have enough goals running about. But, um, hmm. the, one, the one thing I noticed in terms of reproduction, as I, as I recall, I think it's in June Messiah, where Paul offers 
offers them, I think he offers the Bene Gesserit his DNA, is it? But, but it's to be done by artificial insemination or something like that. And the Bene Gesserit have an absolutely no. <laughs> Isn't that correct? I'm wondering if I'm remembering right. Yeah, they, they, it's not until the very end that they finally are kind of forced into having to do artificial. They're yeah, really the, not, so not just, interested in it. Yeah, I think that's to do with, you say, control over their, their own bodies. Uh, if you know, what I mean, and that that idea. I suppose. I don't. Yeah, I suppose they're all after his DNA at that point. Um, hmm. It makes me wonder why they didn't just pop into Caladan when he left and picked up his hairbrush <laughs> or something like that. We know Paul Atreides has got great hair, don't we? It's a, it seems to become a it seems to become a a dominant trait of the character. <laughs> uh, let me just see here. Oh, do -do -do -do. Those are fertile. Let's see. Okay, I've missed a few here. So, do -do. Uh, so we have Carol saying Octavia Butler has had a surge in popularity. Um, Carol, Octavia Butler is uh, one of the authors I haven't read yet, but know quite a bit about. I'm dying to get near her some of her books. Um, it's good, I suppose, living in modern times. A lot of science fiction has been quite hard to get in Northern Ireland for a long time. Marcia Jacobson saying, So sorry, I have to leave for a meeting. Uh, this was so interesting. Congratulations. And then Bronson Bounce, somebody mentioned that Gola came from the dead, so they needed a child first as a guest. So we have a bit of banter going here. Uh, let me see. I mean, Bunny Jesus, no doubt, would make circumstances just so to assure a successful meeting between the two. Uh, Mike S says, Jessica may have been selfish by getting overly caught up in her order's own Kool Aid, but the ultimate goal of the Quizat Sadrach myth program is far worse as it seeks to dominate the universe. Um, I've, in fact, there's a good point. I'll throw this one at you, Cara. Um, in the appendices, as Mike's saying, the whole point of the Quizat Sadrach is kind of Z Zeus's um, desire to rid the world of his heroes. It's to, to renew the human race by war. And um, what was I thinking there? I only got up in the Sorry, oh, I've lost my train of thought there. Oh, the appendices. And uh, I don't know what you think about this. Um, um, I think we maybe chatted a bit about it. I wonder if you've got any opinions on it. In the appendixes, and, in the appendices of June, there's a comment about, and it's about what we were talking about earlier, that the Bene Gesserit had failed to see how their own breeding program had affected them. And it's a, it's a comment about their failure in the Arakeen matter. And it's, it states, uh, I must get this out sometime, that the, 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 the Bene Gesserit's breeding program is not their program and it belongs to someone else. Are you any thoughts on who? <laughs> well, it says like things, it says like it mentions like a higher plan that they were yeah. unaware of. It's, um, I, I mean, I think that might be just Herbert being cryptic um, because the Talaxu had not, not been entered the picture at that point. Yeah. Um, and it's possible, it's just, it's commentary on even when you think you have everything figured out and you've got all your plan, you know, the best laid plans go astray, you know, you can do all the planning you want, but, but chance and different, different circumstances will lead to your plans changing or, you know, he was, he was wanting to look at randomness. Right, like we need to have some kind of random chance. We need to have something that is not a just completely planned everything out because that's just not not workable. Um, but of course, we have to have the Bene Gesserit lose control for there to be some kind of narrative. Because if everything were working according to clockwork, we'd, then it probably no wouldn't be very interesting. That'd be dull as hell, wouldn't it? I I often just think I like to just think it's Zeus. That's that's where I'll go with it. Just leave. <laughs> But it's, it's, it's one of those things that I often wonder what people speculate about, if they've actually noticed this. As you've commented, a lot of people don't read the last two June books. A lot of people stop at June as well. But a lot of people I've oh, discovered yeah. don't read the appendices of June. And we talk, there's, a, there's a, a little mini story in there as well, you know, which I think is quite sad for, for people who miss it. Uh, Karen Rule says, sorry, got to run. This was great. And um, Babs has got a question for you. Question for Kara. Uh, what do you think of the gender swap of late kinds in Danny Villeneuve's movie? <laughs> oh, yes. I think I like the idea and the concept of introducing more, more women, more women of color. That's totally fine. 
for this particular character, and I don't know if they were intending to do this anyway, but I didn't get the strong sense that Kynes is a scientist. And so to me, that was, that was a loss of an opportunity to show a woman scientist. And the movie overall didn't have a strong ecology or environmental theme. And so Kynes, to me, felt like one of the locals, one of the Fremen, and that's why she knew about the desert. Um, but we didn't, we didn't get to see Kynes um, explaining, I mean, really beyond what was, you know, a little bit, we didn't get to see kind of explanations of how the Fremen take water from the dead, like at the banquet scene, or Kynes refusing to spill water because it just goes against his principles, yeah. um, you just don't waste water. Even even if a new duke who's very powerful comes, you just you just don't. And kind of getting to see sort of the, I mean, you see a little bit of it, but the, the kind of the trance that he goes into when Jessica talks about the you know keeping the um, observatory or the, the plant, the place with all the lush plants, keeping that in, in keep uh, in trust for the people of Rackus, like. We don't get to see all those kind of interactions, and and then yeah, the ending, well, kinds ending. We don't get to see that kind of realization about scientists being wrong. And yes. when you read when you read Herbert's um, you know interviews about what kinds was supposed to be as a character in terms of ecology oh, is that yeah. you can be a scientist and think you have everything figured out just like the Bunny Jesuit, but actually, you know, here you are on the sand and there's a spice blow coming up underneath you and you've just told the Fremen to accept this young hero and you're not going to be around to guide the shape and path of this hero and, and he just realizes what he's unleashed upon this planet and none, and none of that comes through um, in the character, so it's whether or not the Fremen would have accepted a woman in that kind of position, it's kind of also part of it, you know, so there's lots of facets where I think problematic that um, people thought that you could just substitute anybody, you know, really for any character, it could just be swapped around, and you you lose something of some of the, the, the deeper messages of the book yeah. in, in doing that. Um, even though I, I really enjoy I really enjoyed seeing a woman one woman of color, you know, in that kind of role, but it's like what they did with it was you know, kind of Brad's got wasn't able to wasn't able to yeah, that do as much as, as, the, as what I would have liked, I suppose. Brad's just got a follow on question. He says, following Babs's question about the gender swap of Leah Kynes. Uh, uh, it says, following Bob's question about how she died, as in Leah Kynes, I remember Doc, that's me, saying it was a home, uh, home goal, Carl, what is your perspective? What what Brad's talking about is that I, I considered um, the whole Leah Kynes character, the gender swap, everything about it was a sort of home goal um, for feminism by a man. I think and, uh, my, I jokingly pointed out that the character gets two phallic deaths <laughs> and that... Um, that, they, that almost any other character could have been gender swapped. And in terms of Leah Kynes, the, just the sheer impact on the story, um, particularly for the, uh, the, the, the things that you've pointed out, the, the banquet scene, the, the garden that's set in trust, that, that's almost a lesson on, um, what are they called, uh, is it the, the chromatic plastics that they use for the change colour during the day and night and how they gather water. Um, there's so many ecological lessons there. If 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 the character had been stayed true to the, I suppose, the real character, I don't think we would would have made any difference. But I, I think any other character, arguably apart from maybe Paul or Jessica, could have been gender swapped. And uh, if you want to make you know get that kind of balance of female representation into the film, um, but in terms of how uh, well, as I said, just it was done by a man written by a man, my point of view was that I thought this is one of the strongest characters in literature. What are you doing? Um, and, and the whole idea, the impression I got is they want to make it, make Jessica stronger. And I thought that they did the opposite. But in terms of, I suppose that I just thought it was quite funny that the high, instead of dying the way the character should do, with that moment of realisation on the spice blow, etc., 
we have the character stabbed by a man and then up comes the worm and, and we don't get to see the whole worm and I just thought that's two phallic symbols right there so a sword and a worm. so Brad's just wondering what your person that's what we were talking about from this discussion we've had and uh, I just thought it was a bit of an own goal I thought it was a bit stupid uh, <laughs> if we could done it any other way but um well they they, they also, also make Leah a lot, lot more um kind of under, under the, the thumb, thumb of the emperor, emperor. Mm. you know there's lines, lines about you know the emperor <laughs> commands me to see yeah, nothing and say nothing it just like they, they, they kind of neutralize the kind of rebellious nature of liet like i'll pretend that i'm working for the imperium but actually everything i'm doing is against yeah. that um so that's yeah there's kind a lot of, of yeah kind of tying tying her hands behind her back i guess it felt like that's that's the character like wasn't able to do much except just save you know to kind of save them at the end yeah it's 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 i mean i thought the actress was really impressive but it, to me it's what's missing, missing from, from the character, the character. Especially, especially i think it's going to have a lot of consequences for the story I, uh, the one thing that i said um was that I hope that it can be salvaged through the Fremen. I feel like that the other way that we're mainly educated is by the planet and the Fremen, but the eight kinds is our real educator in the books. And of course he's wrong. That's the great thing. Is that, as you said, the, the, the scientist I've got always right, thinking logically, blah, blah, blah. That moment of realisation is his eureka moment. I go, oh, bugger, I've got it all wrong. Boom. <laughs> and I always found it very funny. I thought it was a really comic death in a... In a in, a, in that kind of tragic comic kind of way, if you know, uh, probably not. Uh, I don't know if you know Aeschylus, the father of tragedy, died by getting a tortoise dropped on his head. I think that's hysterical, yet quite tragic at the same time. So that that's the kind of thing I'm trying to talk about. So, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's, I, I still think it's a bit of a. I'm hoping it doesn't have. For me personally, I don't know. Um, I was just thinking that it's going to have so many ripples that down the line that if they ever want to keep going and the further they go with it I don't know in terms of the eco ecological message um, which is the one that I thought was most timely right now you know I think uh, I think June came too late to do anything about Trump but as, uh, as as I keep pointing out to people June's a warning about dangerous leaders you shouldn't need to be warned about somebody I think Trump what he is is quite obvious but uh, of course we've got Boris Johnson on the other side here you know but it's um the, the dangerous hero Kynes is also a hero to the, the Fremen and um, the, the you wouldn't really have Paul without Paul's success is predicated on Kynes being that kind of John the Baptist paving the way yeah. for um, his acceptance so he's, he's very in, integral to um, even the Benny Gesserit being able to, you know, they, they all, everything comes together, the prophecy comes together, Liet's ecological work, they all come together kind of at the perfect moment and have this perfect storm that Paul then is able to ride. But, you know, he's not the one that makes it, he just taps into it. Yeah. Also, also particularly with, with Pardo Kent, I think his father, um, you really do get that. I'm going to manipulate the hell out of these people uh, right at the start. Um, and this, it's interesting. I often think that if you if we read June, they really should take that appendix and shove it at the start, as I put it as a prologue. Um, but the the thing that appalls me is that so many people go, oh, finish the book, just appendices. And, oh no, you did. Oh, you've no idea, really. Um, it's it's really sad because I think the the Kynes family, I think they're fascinating. I think they're there's a lot, so much to them. Um, but in terms of you're absolutely right. Paul could, it's, it's almost as if the Bani Gesserit, it's the missionary and protective have kind of made things, it makes what Pardo wants to do kind of work. And in that sense, it, it, if you see, I mean, the myths of one, I need a son, I've got to have a son for these people to do this. I've got to, you know, they marrying into the front. Everything's about getting what he wants for the planet. And, and again, it's that Western man, the attitude of science and technology, the, the, the what do they call a the Presbyterian fixation that tech can solve any problem, as Frank puts it. Um, there's so much to these characters. Um, and as much as we see how much has been dumped out of the film at the minute, um, and I don't know, I, 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 I still think myself, we've, we've talked about this a wee bit on the channel, I think what we've got is a, a very look at the shiny, shiny version of June. It's, it's just nice to look at. And it has no substance at all. 
Um, it has a little bit, don't get me wrong, but uh, um, mm, every, every, the more I keep thinking, but the more every, every time I see the film, I come away liking it less and less each time. And, uh, and the, the side effect of that is I've now watched David Lynch's Dune about three times in the last couple of weeks and gone, this is great, it's so much fun. And I, you know, um, I don't know, I suppose it's a matter of taste, you know. Um, let's see. <coughs> Probably oh, one. Oh, one. Maybe wrap wrap up soon. <laughs> no problem. My bladder's starting to go. Actually, I'll run through the last these week we comments and questions. Can we'll try and wrap up in about five minutes if that's okay? Um, because we have a few people heading off. Uh, probably let's just see. Just to run through the last week questions here. Brad saying yep, evolution definitely involves more dominant theme throughout the series than ecology, which dies off throughout. Uh, Babs Bell saying, I get it. The Kynes character in the film is not developed enough to put across the significance of the character as portrayed in the book. Absolutely, I think. Good point, Babs. Um, well, listen, uh, I'll, we'll wrap things up. Uh, I'd just like to say to everybody out there, thanks very much for joining us on the station and for joining me and Cara tonight. Uh, we have, uh, a wee, do you want to mention a wee bit of blurb about the book there? Quickly, Cara, before we finish. Just in terms of where it's available and if there, etc. Um, I'll just say that if you are looking for this book, it's a women's agency in the June universe. It's sort of book you can request your local library to get in if you need to read it. But uh, I'll let Karen tell you a wee bit quickly just before about it before we finish. Where is the book? Is the book available at the moment, Karen? How can we get our hands on it? Yeah. So if you go, I've put up the information on my website at the publications link. Um, it's available the best way to get it is through the website because i only make money from book sales if you go through the affiliate link so it's there's a technical issue with the springer palgrave site so you can't find it on that site and the ebook is not yet available i'm not sure when that will be fixed but for now only the hard copy is available and through the end of december palgrave has a 50 percent off Coupon, so I put that up on my website, which makes it a little bit more affordable. But it's an academic book, so yeah, it could be a bit pricey. As uh, Kara's site is junescholar.com. Uh, once this, um, once we finish the broadcast, I'll get whatever details. I'll add them to the description uh, on the video, and uh, we'll also um, I'll get them and put them up as a wee post on the community se uh, section of the YouTube channel. So, um, uh, post, what's that? Post Capre Astro, <laughs> Astro Morph, that's an interesting name. Uh, just says, great discussion. Um, well, listen, folks, uh, Carla, thank you so much for being my first ever guest on the station. I don't know in terms of technical issues, I think there's been a few things, but they're maybe not our fault, but we'll look into that. But um, it's been an absolute delight. And as I said, we'll put up some more information about Carla's book, uh, Women's Agency in the Junior Universe, on the YouTube channel. In the meantime, as usual, I'd like to thank Cara very much for joining me. Uh, this has been great, and I've really enjoyed it. And I have to say I've had a bit of a day here before before we got started, so uh, the nerves were getting to me a wee bit, I think. I just had the calendar. Just all sorts of madness happening around here. And as, as I'm sure you know, we've had explosions and all sorts of things. But, um, yeah, today was quite a mild day and nothing, yeah, but still ended up a bit crazy. So just, I'm really pleased that everything's gone so well tonight. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, Cara. And um, thank you so much for the discussion. And to everybody else uh, watching, and thanks for your input and your questions. And um, I'll be seeing you all again on Friday, hopefully for our Science Fiction Friday. Uh, in the meantime, I'd just like to say goodbye to you all. And uh, I'll be bye-bye from Cara. If you want to give everyone a wave, that's what I tend to do. And, uh, thank okay, you. Thank you very much. And we'll all see you very soon. Thank you, everybody, and take care no matter where you are.